Jennifer Bat is a lecturer in English at the University of Bristol. And her research, um, very different, um, uh, uh, focuses on 18th century poetry. And she's been using computational models to uh, find verse in 18th century newspapers um, and uncover that sort of uh, complex, expansive, ephemeral poetic culture that's um, uh, been lost to us over, over the, the last couple of centuries. So this is an important um, and difficult effort. I'd say it's, uh, if you will, it's just on the edge of what can be done um, today. Uh, fortunately, she's not working alone. There are other um, activities in the world looking at this challenging problem, uh, such as those of the EDA project in the US. I uh, sit on the advisory board there, and, and that's benefited um, from the interactions that we've had uh, with Jennifer um, as well. Um, there's a huge range of techniques that can be employed to make this happen. Um, and uh, I think we're all trying to figure out what, what works and, and what doesn't. So, so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Jennifer. Um, tell us about her work. So when we think about the literary past, we are often thinking about books, be that printed books or manuscripts. But the 18th century was a century in which there are increasing numbers of newspapers being printed in London and in the English provinces and in Scotland and in Ireland, and to a lesser extent Wales. And as a result, I suspect that printed books and handwritten manuscripts are not the most likely place that most people would have encountered texts like poems. Instead, where people were more likely to see poetry on a regular basis was not in books or in manuscripts, but in periodicals, in newspapers and in magazines and the kinds of media that were becoming increasingly part of more and more people's everyday lives. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are all that familiar with what an 18th century newspaper looks like, so it's worth showing you an example. This is the Westminster Journal for the 3rd of March, 1745. It's a four-page newspaper, as many papers in the period were. On its first page, um, there's an essay on contemporary politics. Then follows some foreign news, home news. In the third column of page three, there is a list of marriages, deaths, bankrupts, um, account of the latest price of stocks, uh, and some adverts. And the adverts continue on to the next page. Um, and they're mainly for books. And in the midst of this, handily pointed out there for you there, um, is a poem right there in the centre of a section on news, um, a topical political poem. This particular newspaper was a weekly paper issued every Saturday. Other papers were issued three times a week, typically Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Some came out six times a week. And many of these papers are coming from London, but as the century progresses, you get more and more in the provinces too. Then, as now, different newspapers had different stances on things, different political stances, um, but many contained verse. And poems don't just appear in, po in papers that have literary inclinations. They appear across a whole range of different papers. Some papers, you might have a poem every issue or so, uh, at least one, one in every issue. Um, for other papers, it might be every other issue. In other papers, um, there might be a poem every few issues, every couple of weeks. This material, this poetry, has been routinely dismissed by literary scholars and newspaper historians um, as trite or trivial material, as filler, as not worth our time. And as a result, we know very little about it. We don't know how much of it there was or who wrote it about when and where then why they wrote it, or whether any of it was any good. So I'm interested in this body of material, not just because there might be some lost masterpieces in there that we've forgotten about, but also because of what this body of material might reveal about literary culture more generally. 
Um, the quantities involve testify to the fact that we're dealing with something culturally significant here. The six newspapers listed here, um, a few hundred poems, and that's just for one single year. There's a lot of this stuff, and if we don't know what it is, then we lack an accurate picture of the literary landscape in which 18th century readers and writers were operating. Uh, it might be instructive to give you an example. So, um, in late 1732, a man called Stephen Duck, who was then a celebrity poet, um, he wrote a topical poem about a new building that had been put up in the Queen's Gardens at Richmond. Apparently, without his, no his, no his knowledge, this poem is published in the Daily Post Boy in early December. The next day, it is reprinted in two other newspapers. A few days after that, it appears in two more. A few days after that, it's reprinted in the Northampton Mercury. So we're getting to the provinces. And a couple of days later, there's a commentary essay. Um, meanwhile, Stephen Duck, the author of this poem, sees a copy of his poem being published in one of these newspapers and collaborates with a friend to get an authorised, corrected version of the poem published in the Grub Street Journal. And from there, it's copied into a couple of magazines. This all happens in less than a month. And somehow, through one of these publications, or one that I've not yet traced, the poem gets into the hands of a guy in Enniskinnel, Enniskillen, um, over the Irish Sea. Um, he writes a response, and that's first published in the Dublin Press, and then it's copied into the English press. So this is a dynamic, ephemeral literary culture, a web of connections in which newspapers are reacting to each other and in which writers are responding to each other. And it offers insights into who participates. It prompts reflections on taste, questions of taste and novelty. What is prompting this republication? So one reason we don't know a lot about this newspaper verse is because it is difficult to access. Uncovering newspapers can be a laborious process, flipping through historical volumes, um, looking at microfilm. The advent of dis uh, resources like Gale's digitised Bernie collection um, has brought these newspapers onto our desks, onto our laptops, uh, but still the, the discovery of verse involves a lot of methodical clicking through image after image. So when labs open their last call for projects, um, I thought of the poems in newspapers, and I was aware of the kinds of work that labs had done before um, with Bob Nicholson and Katrina Navikas to try and find things in newspapers. So I wondered, is there a way of speeding up the process of discovery? So coming to this with a very limited technical background, I had no idea how hard or how easy this might be. Um, but I was guided very much um, by Mahendra and by Ben O'Steen um, in how we were going to go about this. Um, and Ben did a lot of the work to define, to, to uh, come up with methods for how we would, would approach this. Um, so if I, I mangle anything in what follows, I apologise to Ben. Um, so how do you try to automate the discovery of poems in newspapers? One problem is we don't know where those poems are. They're not in every issue, and they're not on the same page of every issue when they do appear. So a few examples here um, from pages one, two, three, and four of different newspapers. Oh, so the poems aren't always on the same page. Um, another issue is, if you've ever used the Bernie collection, you'll know that sections of it are tagged. There are specific tags, so there are some of its content is tagged as news, some of it is tagged as classified ads. Um, there's, a, there's a tag that might be relevant for us, arts and entertainment. We might expect that poems would be tagged as arts and entertainment. But in my four examples here, only one out of the four was tagged as arts and entertainment. And doing a bit of sampling, it looks like uh, something like one in 10 of the poems uh, in there seems to be tagged as arts and entertainment. So there's no shortcut to find poems that way. So we don't know what page a poem will be in, and we don't know what section it's in. On other projects, other projects that labs have worked on, um, like Hannah Ro Rose Murray's project last year, um, looking for black abolitionists, details of those in the newspaper archives, 
they were looking for a specific set of words. Um, but there aren't a specific set of words that occur with poems. Um, in these examples, we have um, stanza and lines appearing near two of my example poems, but there aren't words like poem or verse. So that's not a shortcut um, to find them either. But poems do have some distinctive characteristics that make them potentially discoverable. So when I am looking through a newspaper looking for its verse, what I am looking for is a distinctive profile, a shape. Amidst columns of justified prose, um, poems with a sometimes indented left-hand margin uh, and a usually unjustified right-hand margin, poems stand out as something different. So could we get a computer to look for that? As Adam mentioned, um, we're not the only group of researchers and programmers asking this question. Um, similar questions have been asked by a team of researchers headed by Elizabeth Lorang uh, in the US. The Image Analysis for Archival Discovery, or ADA project, is working to see if they can use uh, image recognition software to look for poem-shaped things in 18th and 19th century newspapers. They're using kind of image recognition software, but we wanted to see if there was another way to try and solve this question. Working with, with Ben Osteen of the labs team, Ben suggested that we might investigate the optical character recognition data, the OCR data, that had been harvested when newspapers were first digitised. So, I'm sure most of you know, when OCR software runs, it identifies the letter shapes that it thinks it sees on the image. It also locates the coordinates of that shape on the image. And from this, it works out the placement of the word that it sees on the image. From this, we hypothesise that we might be able to identify the shapes of lines of text. And from there, where the text seemed to have shapes that resemble justified lines of prose, and where it seemed to have shapes that resemble verse. And ben had a way of turning this into some numbers that we could get the computer to look at. Another indicator that we thought might be useful was capital letters. In the 18th century, the first, line of a, of, the first letter of a line of verse is always a capital. Sometimes lines begin with a single or double quotation marks or open bracket signal symbols. Um, so the first character is not always a capital letter, but the first letter is. Um, and generally speaking, verse has a much higher proportion of lines that begin with capitals than prose does. Um, so with these indicators and a few others, um, we took a sample of data from two years, from 1745 and 1746. And Ben chunked that data into sections and generated numbers for each section that related to the characteristics that we were looking for. And then with, some naive Bayesian, with a naive Bayesian classifier, um, he got the machine to sort those sections of text, grouping them into clusters that had similar characteristics, with the idea being that once the machine had grouped together the text that it thought had similar characteristics, we could then go and look at those clusters to work out which of them if any of them seem to be poetry. Um, and Ben also worked with Gail to give us a kind of a, a nice little workflow that took us straight from our metadata to the image of the page within Gail's Artemis interface. So we could check what it was that, we, that the computer had identified. And so as we were looking at the clusters that emerged, there was one that Ben identified as potentially promising. So I took a look and the first page was this. And it had some poems on. The second page didn't have poems on. The third page didn't have poems on either. But the fourth did. And the fifth. And the sixth. The seventh didn't have poems on, but it has a thing that looks like a poem. <laughs> and we thought we'd find things that looked like poems that had similar characteristics and we'd have to disambiguate them. But we knew that it might be a possibility. But then I kept looking. And the more I looked, the more I didn't find poems. It wasn't clear whether the cluster that we had that had poems in was identifying poems or whether it was identifying something else. Um, 
And I went from thinking, hurrah, we solved this, to maybe, maybe we haven't. Um, so I went to have a look at the data set in more detail, and I'll kind of quickly talk through what was there. So as many before me have observed, um, the OCR that was generated when the Bernie collection was digitized a decade or so ago has some, soft, uh, some shortfalls. <laughs> Um, firstly, the OCR software struggles to interpret some features of 18th century typography, but also some of the bitonal images that it's working with um, are marred with shadowing, bleed through, and other imperfections. And this makes it difficult for us to reliably pinpoint the, the identifying f uh, characteristics that we were talking about. The shape of the line on the page, the capital letters. Even when the OCR is less catastrophic than this, there are problems. So here is a poem. And what I'm interested in here is how the beginning and end of each line of verse seems to have some extra characters. If we zoom out on the page, we can see what's happening here. The OCR hasn't been able to tell where the edge of the, the column is. Um, so while we're looking for shapes that look like this, what we're actually getting is a shape more like this. And that other indicator, um, capital letters, is a problem here as well. Because the OCR is catching those letters at the end of the adjacent column, it is bundling them, on, them onto the line. So a line of verse, uh, a, a section of verse that should register as having five out of six lines that begin with capitals, Instead, we have two out of five that begin with capitals. Um, and another variant of that uh, particular problem. Here, um, all of the lines of this poem should begin with capitals, but the OCR is catching little imperfections in the image to put in dashes and dots where dashes and dots should not be. So that interferes with what we were looking for. So. The data that we were trying to, the data set that we were trying to apply these methods to isn't perhaps optimized to give us the results that we were after. I was really hoping um, to be addressing you today from atop of a large pile of poems that I could share with you. Um, but this pro project hasn't yielded the quick wins that I was, I was hoping for. Um, with some refinements to our methods, I think we could get the computer to return some poems from this data set. But given the messiness of that data set, I don't think you'd be able to trust it to reliably return everything. And that's not to say, though, that these methods, this approach, might not work, work reliably um, on a cleaner set of OCR data. But with the historic OCR that we're working with, I don't think it's quite possible. So there have been no quick wins, as I say, but it's been a valuable project, for me at least. I wanted to know whether it could be done easily, and the answer seems to be, no, not easily. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work with some incredibly knowledgeable and experienced people here at the British Library, um, and develop some new collaborations in Bristol um, with colleagues at the Jean Golding Institute. And now I have a much more nuanced understanding of how the Bernie Collection uh, itself works, the digitized database, um, on of its strengths and weaknesses. And that's really useful for me um, as I push on in the work that I'm doing to understand this vast and uncharted territory, the poetic culture of 18th century periodicals. Thank you. I... Uh... I remember talking to you about this last year, and, and yeah. particularly about the, the ragged right yeah. nature of poetic setting and the capitalization. It's really interesting to see what you've made of this and the things you've hit along the way. Um, and uh, uh, it's quite funny, actually, um, in, a, in an odd way, seeing what a pig's ear of OCR makes of the text. Um, and, and, Comparing it with the pig's ear 
that the automatic transcription software was making on the video in the proof. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is not threatening our jobs anytime soon, I think. But I've got a particular question, which it, maybe you can answer, or maybe someone else, which is, I think that you mentioned that the images which you're working with are, are bitmaps, they appear black and white. And um, because I do quite a lot of stuff around imagery myself, I was wondering, had you had the chance to work with grayscale data, would there have been a better chance of detecting the true letter forms, things not dropping out or choking up? Um, uh, we know the problem with the process of the planetary scanners scanning stuff at really quite low resolutions, but one wonders what the lessons are for any future digitization projects that anyone gets themselves involved in. Are they throwing away too much? Um, I'm not an, an expert in, in OCR, but um, yeah, I mean, I imagine that there is a better um, uh, success rate with other forms of, of looking, um, uh, uh, not bitonal ways of looking at the image. Um, and yeah, I think there are really important lessons to be learned um, from what has been has been done. And we are in a the, the OCR that we were looking at was done kind of ten more than ten years ago. So there have been advances there as well. So I think future digital projects can make a better fist of it. One would hope. Thank you, Hi, that was absolutely fascinating. But I was wondering where the decision came to proceed with OCR software rather than image recognition software, because it seems to me that that would have given you perhaps a better chance of identifying the poems through the indentation if you were doing it image-based. Sure. Such as like for Python language, for example, like TensorFlow libraries are great for that. Yeah, um, but there, I guess there are a few reasons. One was that we had the OCR here, that the, the, the team that I was working with had that easily accessible. Um, and another reason was another team, another project uh, is doing that work. So we didn't want to duplicate what they were doing, but to see if there was an alternative way um, of, of, of answering the same question. Great, thanks so much.